Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. You should be thankful. You were on God's wake up list. A lot of people didn't wake up this morning. You know that a person dies every six seconds? I don't know if you knew that. Person goes to sleep every six seconds. Decision is made. Well, first and foremost, I want to bring you all greetings from the sunny state of North Carolina, United States of America, where, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I reside with my tribe there. Um, So we're the Braxton Six. So my wife and my four children, they send their prayers as well as their encouragement. They're excited um, that I was here, even though they miss me, but nevertheless, they're encouraged. My daughter was, uh, my oldest daughter was complaining. She was wondering, you know, why does Papa have to go preach? She says, why does it take so long? Why does he have to go so many different times? And my son, who's five years old, his birthday is on Monday, which is why I have to fly out tonight, because you can't miss your son's birthday. And so my son said to my daughter, he said, well, don't you know? He said, you know, when... Papa goes to preach the gospel. Jesus said he'll come back when the gospel has been preached in all the world. So obviously he needs to go so Jesus can come. That's what he said at five. So it lets you know that children are listening. And they're aware and they understand deep things of God that we think are too heavy for them. We're never going to win youth that are going to be solid for Christ by not challenging them, not believing in them, even from a very young age. So I was inspired and I was thankful to hear that my son understood that at five. I can only imagine where God will take him by the time he's my age. That's your prayer as a father is that your children will be better than you by God's grace. Would you bow your head with me? to pray spirit of the living God it is my prayer that you would fall afresh upon me Lord it is our prayer that the spirit of God would take the words of scripture and Lord that he would cut through every soul Whatever distractions the devil has planned, may they fail. May you place a hedge around this place. And Lord, as you visit with your children, it is our prayer that the sweet, sweet spirit of Jesus may descend upon this place and revive us again. This is our prayer. And we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. It was August 23rd, 1994. There was a small abandoned barn on the island of Jura in the Scottish Inner Hebrides. It was not newspapers, it was not magazines, it was not junk paper, but it was one million dollars or British pounds sterling that were burning in this barn. It took 67 minutes to burn 1 million pounds in cash in this barn. It was done by a band called KLF. And they consider this a work of conceptual art to burn a million dollars. Not only did they burn the money, They videotaped themselves burning the money. So as they're videoing this, they say, hey, we're burning one million pounds. This led, and matter of fact, the video is on YouTube. You can find it. This led to a surprising amount of hatred against them. They weren't expecting that. You see, they started getting interviews with different individuals. And they said, well, let's ask the band what they think. And the members of the band, they said, 
Well, you know, it's just a pile of paper. You know, it's nothing. It's not bread. It's not apples. Right. There's no less bread in the world. There's no less apples in the world. We just burned up some paper. But you see, the reality was people who responded to them did not share their view. They weren't angry if they burned up the money on prostitutes in Dubai. They wouldn't be angry and upset if they decided to get all the major rooms on the top floor of the Burj Al Arab. No one would have complained. But because they burned cold, hard cash, people were upset. Why? Because of the possibility of what that money could have bought. See, many thought to themselves, I could have paid for my school loans. I could have paid for my housing. I could have sent money back home and bought houses or took care of an orphanage. Could have fed the poor. Could have bought land and crops in order to give back for generations. You could have put that into an educational investment fund. But you see, it is this psychological aspect of human nature that often prevents us from one of the most momentous experiences in all of the Bible. The moment when a person decided to waste on Jesus. See, it's not just this one million dollars in a barn that people get upset about. There's a story in the gospel in which an individual decided to spend something very expensive on Jesus. And it was interesting. It was not the atheists. It was not those who were unbelievers who were complaining. It was fellow disciples. Wondering why would you even do this particular waste? I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to go with me to the gospel of Mark chapter 14. What book did I say? Okay, what chapter? 14. That's right. Beginning in verse 3. When you have it, just say amen. Mark chapter 14. We're going to answer three questions. The first question we're going to answer is, what does it mean to waste on Jesus? Our second question is going to be, why did she waste on Jesus? And our third question will be, what is the result of wasting on Jesus? Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 3. Are you there? Can you say amen? amen. The Bible says, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spark, spikenard. Then she broke the flask, poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves, said, why was this, what kind of oil? What does your Bible say? It's okay, you can talk to the preacher. What kind of oil was it? It was a fragrant oil. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Why was this fragrant oil, what's the word? Wasted. Someone said, because an individual brought a gift that was expensive and poured it on the head of Jesus, they said that was a what? It was a waste. Now watch the psychological mindset of money kick in. It's been around for a long time. Notice what's, what they say next. Verse 5, for it might have been, there's the possibility, for it might have been sold for more than what? 300 denarii and given to the what? And they criticized her sharply. The word in Greek is they scolded her. They corrected her. They pulled her aside. See, I know some people understand what I'm talking about. When you come to church and all of a sudden you're having a great Sabbath and somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, Brother, can I talk to you for a second? All of a sudden your heart rate goes up because you know it ain't good news. Somebody better say amen. Amen. Then they pull you aside. They catch you coming out the bathroom. Excuse me, can I, can I talk to you for a second? You know, yesterday you made some comments. And as they begin to lay into you, you're like, man, you could just see the sun going down on your Sabbath. And you're thinking to yourself, man, I should have never came to church today. 
But here was this woman deciding that she was going to take this oil that the Bible says was worth 300 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. So much you got paid for one day's work. That means this flask of oil, it was pure perfume, was one year worth of money. Now, I don't know about you if you got one year's of income just sitting aside. And then not only do you got one year of income sitting aside, you spent one year of your money on a flask of perfume. Has anybody ever done that before? If you did, don't raise your hand. Because somebody's going to look at you like you're crazy. Did you know I had to do the research? Because I thought there's no way perfume would cost this much. Maybe it was just back then. But then, you know, I did a little research. You know, when you go shopping for perfumes and colognes and all these things, they have different sayings right at the bottom to let you know what it is. So you look down and you say, okay, it's, uh, okay, eau de toye. You say, okay, that means that it has a little bit of alcohol in it. That means it's 7 to 12% perfume. It only lasts four to five hours. It's interesting. Now, if you get a body mist, that's only three to five percent perfume. It lasts one to two hours. If you take a eau de parfum, this is 12 to 15 percent out perfume. It lasts six to eight hours. But if you get pure perfume oil, it's 20 percent perfume. And this can last eight hours or longer. But how much of it? I want you to understand, this is one spray. But you know, the most expensive is this flower called Oris. For one eighth of an ounce of this perfume, it's $516 for one eighth of an ounce. Now, let me do the math for you here. If you had a full bottle, you would be paying $49,536. Guess what the average wage is nowadays? It's about $50,000. In America, so I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm, wait a minute, wait a minute. So right now, even today, if you wanted to buy pure oil of perfume, it would cost you $600 for one-eighth of an ounce. This woman went and procured an entire flask of the perfume. But you see, the problem is, where did she get the money for this? See, if you know anything about who this woman was, it was Mary Magdalene. We know what she used to do as a profession. We know where a lot of her money came from, prostitution and adultery. So here she was selling her body to the lusts of all these men and collecting all this money. But finally she found a man that saw something more than her physical beauty. She finally found a man that saw past all her faults and all the issues of her past mistakes. She found a man that said you're valuable not because you're pretty. Not because you're intelligent, not because you got a lot of money, not because you're one of the most desirable women in Israel. You are valuable because of the image of God, because of the potential of you revealing the character of God in your life, in spite of your past. God was not done with you, Mary. These are the words she heard from Jesus. And so before we transition into why she wasted on Jesus, we got to come to this final last point about what does it mean to waste on Jesus? You know how many times I sit in church board meetings. I sit in church meetings, committees, and people will sit in nickel and dime you for basic stuff in the church. Why we got to pay all that money for that equipment? Why we got to pay all of this because of the sound equipment or for the microphones or the piano? Why do we got to pay all of this for these people to go in the pathfinders to go on some sort of outreach somewhere? But you know, it's so interesting that when somebody says, you don't know what God has done for me. 
And my desire is not to give to the poor. My desire is not to go reach out at the labor camp. My desire is not to go over there and feed some of those who are less fortunate. I want to give something just to Jesus himself. I want to give it to God. And people say, but if you donated that money to the church and you let us do this and this and this, this, look at what we can do. Why this? Finish it for me. Waste. But you know, it's interesting what Jesus said. The Bible says in verse six, Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? That's a good question for Jesus to ask. Some people in church, they just troubling people. Elijah was called the troubler of Israel, but we got some troublers in here this morning. Some of us are just troubling people. And Jesus said, why do you trouble the woman? And he goes forward and he says, she has done a good work for who? For me. She did a good work for Jesus. Can you imagine people will be upset because you're trying to do a good work for Jesus? In the church. Listen, you know how many times when I meet young people that sense the call of Jesus on their life to answer the call to be a good soldier? And you know, their number one barrier is not usually unbelievers. I sat down with a young lady who was about to go to law school. She told her parents she was going to take a year off from college to serve as a missionary for a year. Her parents said, no, you're not. Someone else can be a missionary. Because it's interesting, right? We all want the gospel to be finished. Amen. We all want to go home. Amen. But we want everybody else to be missionaries except for our children. Well, they can go serve, but not you. You got to go get your law degree. Then after you establish your law practice and make X amount of money, then you can go serve Jesus. Because the first question is going to be, if you take a year off, why this waste? But the Bible is letting you and I know that wasting on Jesus is not a waste. Sometimes because of what God has done for you, you just want to do something for the Lord. It doesn't have to make sense to other people. It doesn't have to agree with their own opinion. Because some things are just your opinion. They're not in the word of God. They are not the standard for all doctrine and the basis of every reform. It's just your opinion. You can feel the way you feel, and I will respect that, but please believe. There was no one inside of Israel or outside of Israel that was going to stop Mary from breaking that flask on Jesus' head. You think she cared that those men looked at her like she was beneath the dirt before their feet? She was disregarding all of that hatred. Always going to be haters, always will be haters when you come in to serve Jesus. But she disregarded that. She disregarded all the conversation. She didn't even argue for herself. She didn't even try to explain. You know, sometimes we have to come to God in a certain way to recognize, I don't have to explain myself to you. It was my money. It was my offering to my God because of the blessing that he brought in my life. Somebody better say amen. amen. So that's okay. You can do whatever you want with your money. You can do whatever you want with your offering. But Mary had decided in her heart, I'm going to waste on Jesus. One year worth of money broken on the head of Jesus. People said, why this waste? Brothers and sisters, you and I have to recognize Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you and you'll be able to serve them. But you don't always have opportunities to serve Jesus. When those opportunities present themselves for you to give a very costly offering to God, you take that chance and you waste on Jesus. You see, this isn't popular to stand out this way. It's interesting that the one that stuck out was the one that was most thankful for Christ. The one that caught everybody's attention was the one that was wasting on Jesus. Giving lavish gifts to her God. To her Savior. To her Lord. But she didn't make sense economically. Didn't make sense based on the budget or the plan. 
didn't have to make sense. All she wanted to do was give it to Christ. But you know, I got to move on to my second point. My time is quickly running away from me. The, qu the second question we're going to answer is, why did she waste on Jesus? I want you to take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. When you're there, you can say amen. amen. All right. The Bible says, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a what? She was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him. What was she doing? She was weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know. Who and what manner of man this is who is touching him? For she is a what? She's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. You know, God can read your judgmental thoughts. <laughs> so he said, teacher, go ahead and say on. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay... He freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, Simon, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. With her tears... Listen to this. She washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, and for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same does what? Loves little. You say, why is this woman wasting on Jesus? She's wasting on Jesus because she feels as if God has forgiven her an irreparable debt that she cannot repay. The man said, this woman is a sinner. If you knew who she was, you wouldn't even let that woman touch you. How many men have been through that woman? And you are the God of the universe, the holy God, Jehovah, that seeks exalted the most high. And you would let this lowly woman who has sold her body for money touch you? Jesus, no way that this man is the son of God. No way this man is a prophet. Jesus said, see, what you don't recognize is she's coming in here to waste on me because she recognizes how much she has been forgiven. She loves a lot because she's been forgiven much. You see, I, I remember when we started this series on Wednesday night, I was tempted. I was tempted to tell this story. But for some reason, the Lord impressed me to wait till today. So I said, you know what? That's fine. I will obey the Holy Spirit. But you see, when it comes time to waste on Jesus and people say, Sebastian, where do you get the motivation? Where do you get the resilience? Where do you get the passion? Where do you get the ability to move? And I tell people, I said, you see, it is because like this woman, I know where God found me. Found me in the trash can of society. Because that's where I came from. In gangs, in violence, hypersexual cultures and communities. And in all these different things, I remember I was sitting down talking to my mentor. My mentor had given a Bible study. In this Bible study, he shared a story of a young man who had, who had embezzled money in England 
400,000 pounds from a bank. He was in America, found Jesus like Onesimus, met a Paul, got converted. But what did Paul tell Onesimus to do? He said to do what? To go back. So he told this young man, you need to go back to England and face up. Because if you don't, you won't be able to move forward in your ministry. So here I was listening to this. I was convicted in my heart because I knew I had some things in my past. And I was excited about Christianity. I was excited about the gospel. So at this point in time, I go to my mentor and I said, listen, you know, I heard, you know, the story that you shared. And so I said, I have something I need to talk to you about. So we sat down and I said, these are the, some of the things I did in my past. He said, Sebastian, God's hands are upon your life. This was probably 16 years ago. I just started preaching, just came into the church. He said, God's hands are upon your life. If you don't deal with this now, the devil's going to use this to destroy your ministry. So you have to go back to the police and you have to confess. I bought a ticket, flew down to a detective, called him, walked into his office and said, yeah, there's some things I need to confess. So I'm sitting in this detective's office. This man is beside him. He cannot believe it. And I remember I was sitting there talking to my spiritual mother at the time. And I said, you know, Ma, if I go back to this place and, and confess to these things, I can go to prison for a long time. And I feel like I just finally found my purpose. She said, Sebastian, you need to recognize you choose who you serve. You don't choose where you serve. So if God lets you go to prison, then God wants you to serve him in prison. If God decides you're not going to be free, you're going to be free, then you better serve him in freedom. But you already chose who you're going to serve. So that's the mindset you must bring. So I went down, confessed to this detective, left the office, and he said, all right, we'll be in touch. I'm like, we'll be in touch? I just confessed all these crimes. You're not going to arrest me? He said, no, no, we got to, you know, there's a process. And <laughs> Sure. I'll never forget it. I was leaving my best friend's birthday party, driving. And as I'm driving down, I get pulled over for speeding. Cop comes to the door. He's like, excuse me, Mr. Braxton, you know, blah, 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 blah. License registration goes back, comes back to the car. He probably saw all the charges there. He was thinking, there's no way this is the guy, right? On this, these charges, there's no way this guy's just rolling around a, a random country town. So then he comes back to the car. He says, excuse me, Mr. Brax, have you lived anywhere else? Uh, yeah, I've lived this place, this place. Comes back, goes back again to the car. He says, I'm pretty sure there's a mistake. Can you give me your social security number? Sure. Here's my social security number. So I give this man my social security number. He goes back to the car. The Holy Spirit says, Sebastian, you're about to get arrested. Straight told me. You know, the first words came back to my mind. You don't choose who you serve. You choose what? Where you serve. So I was ready. He came back to the car. Please step out of the vehicle. You have the right to remain silent. He heard me my rights. And I'm sitting in the back of this car. And I wasn't even going to wait to the jail. Sitting there handcuffed in the back seat. We're driving. And all of a sudden, in the, in the immediate silence, I said, excuse me, sir, do you go to church? He looked up in the mirror. He's like, uh, I used to go to church. I'm like, well, what happened? He said, oh, you know, I caught somebody stealing money from the church. And I was like, I don't want to be a part of a religion of thieves. So I don't go to church anymore. <laughs> I said, well, that's interesting. So we don't go to church for people. You go to church for Jesus. So then he kind of got quiet. And then he looked up in the rearview mirror and he said, so these crimes that you're accused of, was this before you were a Christian or after you were a Christian? <laughs> it's a very good question. So I looked at him. I said, oh, no, this is before I was a Christian. If it wasn't for Jesus, I'd probably still be doing the same foolishness. So he's quiet the rest of the drive. We get there to the police precinct. He takes me out. They got to search me and all these different things. And then he comes in right before he releases me and takes off my handcuffs. 
He says, you know, I appreciate our conversation in the car. I'm going to consider going back to church this weekend. I said, well, praise the Lord. So then I go through this <laughs> terrible, terrible experience. I'll never forget, because of the nature of the crimes I had been accused of that I committed, and because of the fact that I was out of state from where I was accused, I was considered a fugitive, high flight risk. So they made sure I was in maximum security. So they're like, this guy is dangerous, you know, blah, 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 blah. He could run. So they wouldn't give me a, a, a butter knife. They won't give me a fork, any sharp objects. Had to take out the shoelaces out of my shoes. So they're like, yeah, we don't give you pillows, anything you can hang yourself with, nothing. So I was sleeping on my shoes. So I'm waiting in this holding cell for four, four days, straight concrete, sleeping on shoes, no blankets. So I'm like, okay, this is, then they said, finally, we're going to move you into population. So as they release me into population, this is maximum security, right? There's no bars, right? There's iron doors, cameras everywhere. The guards don't even come inside where we, where we sleep. So I walk in. And everybody is gathered at the entrance of this place. And as they see me coming in, they're saying to themselves, okay, who's the newest guy, right? Because this is maximum security. So you must have done some bad stuff to get in here. So they're like, hey, bro, you know, what's going on? What did you do? I said, oh, I'm a Christian. You know, I don't talk about it. It's like, you a Christian? What do you mean? You? I'm like, you know, I'm like, no, nah, I don't talk about it. The Bible says it's in the depths of the sea. God forgave it. That's the old life. All things are made new. So they said, okay, so you're a Christian. So then they wouldn't even let me go to my room. They said, all right, all right, since you're a Christian, we got this brother over here. His name's Michi. He got caught with $1 million of marijuana by the police. He was like 18 years old. So he said, you know, he wants to find God's will for his life. Can you help him? Sure. So he throw this guy and me in the middle of the circle, in the middle of prison. It's not a joke. Tell him how to find God's will for his life. So I said, okay, well, if you want to find God's will for your life, I quoted Psalm 119, 105. I said, you know, God doesn't always reveal everything. So you walk in the light that God has given. And then John 7, 17 says, if any man wants to do, know his will, he must first agree to do it. Then you will know. You can't come to God like the news. Can I know your will? And then decide not to do it. I said, you got to commit, Lord, I will do your will. Now tell me what it is. Then I left the circle, went to my room, sat on my bed. My roommate, he's like, hey, what's going on? My name's Alabama. I was like, like the state? He's like, like the state, Alabama. I said, okay, nice to meet you. Then I looked down at the floor, and I noticed that my bed does not have a mattress. He says, yeah, man, they forgot to bring your mattress, right? Then I look at his bed, it's got two mattresses. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. This is interesting. So I said, no problem. I'll call the guards. So I'm sitting down and I'm just taking in the fact that here I am sitting. Maximum security. Before that even happened, I get a knock at my door. Excuse me, brother. Can I talk to you for a second? So this muscular dude tells me, hey, man, I want to I talk to you for a second. So I'm like, all right, sure. So I'm following this guy. He's like, yeah, I want you to come to my room. So I'm following this guy to his room. Of course, like every jail movie I've ever seen is coming through my mind. So I'm like, man, you know, Lord, you know, I was a Marine. I don't have to kill nobody in prison. I don't know what's going to happen. So I follow this guy, sit down in his room, then he takes the blanket, covers the window and the camera. So I'm like, man, my heart's about to jump out of my chest. I'm like, man, this is day one. I just got here. The man looks at me and he says, you know, I'm getting out in a few months and I have a fiance and we are, we're going to get married. But you know, we're Christians and we're trying to figure out how to have a Christ centered marriage. And when I heard you quoting the Bible, because you didn't have a Bible, but you were quoting it. I thought, man, maybe this brother could teach me how to have a Christ centered relationship. I'm like, this is why he brought me in here? He's like, yeah, I, I want to know if you can teach me how to do that. I said, well, I don't have a Bible. I mean, I don't know all the verses. And he says, oh, they won't give you a Bible? I said, no, nah, they're afraid I'm going to paper cut myself to death. 
This is literally what they told me. So I was like, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's like, man, 66 books, he'll bleed to death. Then he won't have to serve. This is what they told me. So he said, well, go to this brother in this other room. So I follow out of the room and go to this guy, look like the godfather, right? He had a long beard, all gray, everything. And so I walk in, I'm like, excuse me, they told me um, I could get a Bible in here. So this guy lifts up his mattress and he says, I have King James, New King James, NIV. <laughs> what translation do you want? That's when I realized all these prison movies are wrong. Not how it is at all. So I'm like, let me get the new King James. He's offering me Bible lessons on Jude. He's like, yeah, man, these are really good. You should take these. We're not supposed to have books. So they're basically, you know, smuggling these things in. So I take the Bible, go back. The guy says, hey, my roommate wants to join. The Bible said, I said, sure. So he puts the blanket back up. We start sitting down. I start the Bible study. By the time I was done with this Bible study, every prisoner was in that room listening to the word of God. So, of course, you already know, you heard me preach this week. I can't preach without making an appeal. So at the end of the, the Bible study, I'm like, all right, how many of you, right? You're going to commit, right? No sex before marriage, right? I'm, I'm going through all these things. So I'm like, raise your hand. These guys raise their hands, answer the appeal. I say a closing prayer. Then the Godfather guy comes up and he's like, listen, man, you're a prophet. I said, no, I'm not a prophet. He says, no, you're a prophet. God sent you to us to teach us the Bible. You got to give us Bible studies twice a day. I'm like, excuse me? He's like, yeah, you're going to give us Bible studies in the morning and the afternoon. <laughs> now, you know, what's crazy is out here, you can't get people to come to a Bible study. You go to prison, they're telling you, you're going to give me a Bible study. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> So twice a day, I'm giving these Bible studies. This goes on for several weeks. After a month, I'm waiting to be extradited. So I'm praying. This is the one great thing about being incarcerated. All the time in prayer. There's no disturbances, no technology, no phones. You know, we only had the TV on for two hours a day. So you got plenty of quiet time to think. And for me to pray. So at night I'm praying in my cell. My roommate is sleeping. And the guard is coming to make sure the doors are locked. So when the guard comes, he pulls the door. He notices that it's locked. He walks by. As I'm praying, I hear a voice tells me, Sebastian, you're leaving the day after tomorrow. I'm like, thinking maybe that's the guard or... Something else, so I look out the window, the guard is not there. So I thought, okay, maybe this is just in my own head. I would love to leave the day after tomorrow. <laughs> so I go back to prayer again, hear the same voice. At this point in time, I know this is God. You're leaving the day after tomorrow. So the next morning, I wake up, give the Bible study, and I said, listen, guys, God told me I'm leaving tomorrow. So these guys are like, how do you know that God... You know, how do you know it was God? How do you know that you're leaving tomorrow? I said, well, I guess we'll find out tomorrow then, if I'm telling the truth. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I know that it was God. They said, all right. So I'm telling them, don't make this jailhouse religion. Don't just change and seek God because you got caught. So then the next day comes, I wake up in the morning. God is good. Let me have breakfast. Soon as I finish breakfast to come back to start the morning Bible study, the guard comes in. He says, Braxton, pack your stuff. You're leaving. Amen. Everyone in the prison freezes. Every single individual stops where they were. And this Godfather guy points at me and he says, I told you he was a prophet. <laughs> I told you. At this point in time, I left this prison with a season of prayer. Think about this. The guards had never, ever seen this. They said, this man is leaving, and these, all these men are getting together, having a season of prayer before he leaves. So finally, when I get down before the judge, I'm standing before the judge. He reads out all the charges, and the judge says, Mr. Braxton, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a missionary. Everybody's head turns towards me. This brother's a missionary. He was doing all of that. 
So he looks and he says, Mr. Braxton, you don't sound like a criminal. I said, well, praise the Lord, because I'm for sure I'm a criminal. <laughs> he says, well, let me, let me see what I can do. Guy walks up to the judge, hands him a piece of paper. The judge looks at this paper. He looks at me. He looks at the paper. He looks at me. He says, Mr. Braxton, um, we're still investigating your case. And um, apparently, three months ago, or by this time, it was four or five months ago, someone had signed this paper that said that uh, as long as you agree not to disrupt the investigation, you can go free. So you never had to go to jail in the first place. I'm like, excuse me? He said, yeah, when they picked you up and arrested you, if you had signed this, they couldn't arrest you. He would have just given you a speeding ticket and sent you on your way. So why, how come, he said, I don't know why it didn't reach you, but it was signed two months before you even got stopped by that police officer. Amen. So then I knew, why was I there? Because God wanted me there. But there was something else he was trying to teach me. Not only was he giving me a powerful testimony as he was dealing with my past, but God was doing for me exactly what he had helped Mary to do, which was to overcome who she was. Realizing that walking the halls of that prison, my nickname was the good brother. That's what people call me. They said he's the only vegan in here. My tray was a different color than everybody else's tray. They said, oh man, that's good brother's food. Don't mess with that food. They're like, God's going to strike you dead. Don't even touch his food. <laughs> this is the mindset that people had. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, because they said every other person here will automatically argue that they are innocent. But the one brother walk in the halls that says, I turned myself in. I confess. I owned up, this is my past, is the one person everybody says, you don't deserve to be in here. When I know I deserve to be in there, 100% behind bars for a long time. But yet because of what God has done and said, Sebastian, I know that you committed some terrible things. I know that you did things you wish had never happened. I know you did things in your past that continue to haunt you. But you need to know, after you're walking the halls of this prison, that you are not the same man that you once were. Amen. That through the power of the grace of God, you have been saved by the gospel. So, Sebastian, you got to ask yourself a question right now. Do you believe that the gospel can transform? Do you believe that you're a different person? Do you believe that when you are in Christ, you are a new creature? Yes. That all things are passed away, and behold, all things, not some, not half, not 80%, not 95%. All things have become new. So then when people come and say, Sebastian, when do you rest? When are you going to take a break? When are you going to stop giving the Lord the best years of your life? Giving your youth to surrender to his cause. Because everyone says, Sebastian, you studied finance. You, were, you could have been working for an investment bank, making six-figure income at 23. I was invited to work for Amazon and for Google. You could have been working here in these companies. I started off as a computer engineer in Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley. These are the things you could have been doing. You are just wasting your life. Why are you wasting? You know why? Because wasting on Jesus... It's not a waste. Amen. See, you love much when you've been forgiven much. But if you think your little sins are petty little sins, you think your mistakes are just, oh, white lies and little issues here and there, and I've had a little jealousy in my life, you're going to love Jesus very little. But when you understand the ugliness that is in the basement of your soul. When you understand the dark, dastardly things that God says, I'm going to take you just as you are. Your beat up, broken life. He says, I'm going to take it. Because let me tell you what I can do with just these broken pieces of a man. 
shattered by your own shame of your past. But Sebastian, I need you to know in the hands of God, this is what I can do. That's why I know when God called me to ministry, he was scraping the barrel of society. He was digging. I need somebody. Worst of the worst. That's why when God first called me, I wouldn't even answer the call. People would email me about coming to a preaching event. I wouldn't even respond. Because I said, I know who I am. I know the things that I've done. I know where I come from. No way. I can stand up there and preach. My mother to this day, she says, of all my children, I would have never in a million years. Just like David, Jesse didn't even call David. I'm saying okay. For sure it's not him. My mom was like, there's no way. Not Sebastian. And yet, here we go. Why should you waste Jesus? Because you understand you have been forgiven much. See, now we gotta say, what is the result of wasting on Jesus? Because my time is basically this far. I want you to go up to John chapter 12. This is where we're gonna end. John chapter 12. Beginning in verse 1. John 12 and verse 1. The Bible says, then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Now, Matthew tells us that this event with this woman happened two days before the Passover. But six days before he came to Bethany, where Lazarus was who had been dead. Whom he had raised from the dead. And there in Bethany... We know the story. They made him a supper. Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with Jesus. And then verse 3, her name is spoken. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. I told you that just one spray would last six to eight hours. She dropped 12 to 16 ounces on Jesus' head. If you end up doing the math, now I want, you to, I want you to keep in mind, three sprays would last an entire day, 24 hours. She put the entire bottle two days before the Passover. So if you calculate it, this oil was on Jesus' body for up to five days. So now you realize that when she wasted on Jesus and Jesus said, oh, she did this for my burial. Burial, that's not coming for another few days. But she anointed him with a oil that would have lasted all the way through the grave. So that means when they sat there having that last supper and he says, one of you will betray me. Guess what Judas could smell? The oil from Mary's alabaster box. And just then he left down and walked down to the garden of Gethsemane. Was met by a soldier and betrayed by a kiss. But when Judas came close, guess what he smelled? The oil from Mary's alabaster box. Amen. Just then the men fell as dead men and they arrested him. Every step they took him to Herod's castle, guess what they smelled? The oil from Mary's alabaster box. Then he came into Pilate's hall. And Pilate came close to Jesus, started talking to him. Guess what they smelled? The oil from Mary's alabaster box. Then he said, oh, you know what? I'm not going to uh, release this man. Do you want? No, okay, you know what? I'll just beat him and let him go. And guess what happened when the Roman soldier was tying him up so that he could beat him 40 stripes minus one? He was smelling the oil from Mary's alabaster box. And just then, after they dragged him back, they said, I want you to give you this cross. All those centurions that laid that cross on Jesus' shoulder, guess what they smelled? The oil from Mary's alabaster box. 
Then Simon the Cyrenian, who was pushed in by the crowd to help Jesus carry it. Guess what he smelled? Walking behind the Lord. The oil from Mary's alabaster box. Then they laid him on the cross, nail by nail, through the hands as they came close, ripped his garments and gambled for it. Guess where all those garment pieces smelled like? The oil from Mary's alabaster box. But see, it wasn't just on his head, it was also on his feet. So there it was, hanging on the cross, right next to him, there was a thief on the cross who looked over the city skyline. He saw the valley of Gehenna, the place where they put the dead bodies after the sacrifices. Immediately he realized in that moment, this is exactly where I'm going to go, I'm going to burn. But then all of a sudden, he smelled something coming from the middle. An oil from Mary's alabaster box. And all of a sudden, he decided to express his faith. And Jesus said, Lord, remember me. And just then, while Jesus was getting beaten, while Jesus was betrayed, while there were 60 accusers coming against Jesus, how could he be encouraged? Because when it seemed like his whole nation had turned against him, his own disciples forsook him. But when he could put his head down in discouragement, he could smell something an oil from Mary's alabaster box. Jesus, I know you feel alone, but there's one person that was not ashamed to waste on you. Go ahead and go to the cross and waste on her. You didn't hear what I just said. Go ahead and waste on Mary because Mary was wasting on you. You don't think heaven and angels and unfallen world say, why would you go die for that little God forsaken planet? There's a billion, billion galaxies. But Jesus was encouraged every step of the way. Because every time he put his head down, every time the sweat, and did you know that when it's oil-based perfume, your sweat causes it to get stronger? Yes. Ooh, he was in Gethsemane. The Bible says he started sweating great drops of blood. He was tempted to turn back. But when the sweat started coming, guess what got stronger? The oil. From Mary's alabaster box. Jesus go forward to the cross. Your sacrifice will not be wasted. There is someone that knows. There is a woman. A prostitute. Destitute. And the very pariah of the Israeli society. That is rooting for you. That says in tears she washed your feet. In tears. She made sure your feet were clean. As you were ready to waste on her. So all of a sudden, Jesus, at every single point, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But even when he felt like his father forsook him, he could smell the oil from Mary's alabaster box. You want to know why you should waste on Jesus? Because it encourages Jesus to continue to press on. That's why Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, what this woman has done will be preached. As a memorial to Mary. She was willing to stand out in her praise and love and adoration of Jesus. She was willing to waste on Jesus. When people were betraying and he felt the kiss of a close friend. He at least had that oil. When his body was given out his last breath, the Bible says he lowered his head. He said, Father, into your hands do I commit my spirit. You know, the last thing Jesus smelled was the oil from Mary's alabaster box. But then, Sunday morning, Amen. <laughs> he woke up. And the best part of waking up was the oil from Mary's alabaster box. And guess who was the first one there? Mary. Excuse me. They've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they have laid him. He said, Mary, Mary. Then she knew the voice. She said, Rabboni, my master, my great one. And she fell at his feet, went to grab him. He said, don't touch me. I know what you're going to do, Mary. I haven't gone to my father. Hold on. Yes, I know you're ready to praise. 
I know you're ready to worship. I know you're ready to surrender and love on Jesus. Just give me a second. I got to handle some business. But just go ahead and tell Peter and John that Jesus is alive. I don't know about you, but we need to find something that we're willing to waste on. And when you give your all, people say, why this waste? Because wasting on Jesus is not a waste. Every step to the cross, there was the silent encouragement of Mary's gift. A fragrant oil that got stronger at Gethsemane, that got stronger at the cross, that got stronger as he was beaten, got stronger as his blood shed to encourage Jesus. You keep going. There's at least one soul here that loves you much, that recognizes what you have accomplished for me that was willing to waste on Jesus. You know, one of my favorite songs it's a song that's called What If I Give All I Have. It's an interesting song because when I look at this, I'm waiting for the lyrics to load in my phone. So I wanted to make sure I read the lyrics exactly how I remember them. The song starts off by saying, he heard the preacher say, a single dime can feed a hungry boy or girl with nothing to eat. So he pulled a dollar from the pocket of his jeans and he asked his mama, how many will this feed? She just smiled and when she told him 10, he reached back in again and said, what if I give all I have? What will that gift do? My child, a gift like that would change the world. It could feed a multitude. He didn't close his eyes or turn away. I can see him standing tall. He saw the need, and I can hear him say, what if I give all? But he reminds me of another little boy who gave to Jesus a gift of fish and bread. I wonder if he said, what if I give all I have? What will that gift do? My child, a gift like that could change the world. It could feed a multitude. And long ago, a father and a son saw the children lost in sin. Can you see the tears in the father's eyes as Jesus says to him, What if I gave all I have? What will that gift do? My son, that gift will change the world. It will free the multitude. What if I give all I have? What will that gift do? My child, a gift like that could change the world. It could feed a multitude. We cannot close our eyes and turn away when we hear his spirit say and when we hear his spirit call we see the need. Now let the Spirit hear us say, what if I give all? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word today. Father, we thank you for this time in communion with you. And Father, we thank you for the example of Mary, teaching us what it means to waste on Jesus, teaching us why we should waste on Jesus, and teaching us the results of wasting on Jesus. 
But now the Spirit is calling. What if I give all? Is there someone here that says, Lord, I have not been giving you everything. I am willing to waste on Jesus today. Whether it is financial, whether it is giving time in your life to service to Christ, to missionary work, whether it's taking something that you would normally spend on yourself, but instead of just giving it to a need, you offer it to Jesus. And so today you say, Lord, help me to give all. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. You say, Lord, help me to give all I have. To believe that God can use a gift like that to change the world. I want to make an appeal. First appeal is some individual here, maybe you haven't made a full surrender to Jesus. But you are sensing that Jesus is calling you to surrender your life to him completely. Maybe you surrender parts of your life, but you haven't surrendered all of your life. And tonight you're ready to make that surrender. Today you're ready to give it all to Jesus. I want to invite you to come to this altar and make that full surrender to Christ. If that's you, just slip out and come. Don't be afraid. Do not be ashamed. Making a surrender to Jesus is one of the happiest days of my life. And it could be one of the happiest days of yours today. Is there anyone here that has not made a full surrender to Jesus and you sense that he's calling you? I want you to slip out and come right here doesn't matter how old it doesn't matter how young and always starts with one that has the courage to make that surrender come praise the lord i need to make a full surrender to jesus and i'm going to do it today every aspect of my life i'm going to make a full surrender to jesus Come quickly. Don't be ashamed. This is where your peace is found. Is in full surrender to Jesus. My last invitation while these others come. Is someone that says, Lord, I hear you calling me. To dedicate some portion of my life to missionary work. And I'm ready to answer your call. I just want you to raise your right hand to heaven. You said, Lord, I hear you calling me. I acknowledge it. And I'm willing to dedicate some portion of my life. Raise it high. To missionary work. Father in heaven, you see the hands. And you see the hearts. We've stood to our feet, Lord, because we want you to teach us how to give all. Lord, we have come to this altar to make a full surrender to Jesus. Every aspect of our lives. To know only the control and lordship of Christ. To waste on him our entire lives and existence. But Lord, we've also raised our hands to say, Lord, we're, we hear your voice calling us to missionary work. And we promise by the grace of God. And through the power of your spirit to give some portion of our lives and time to the cause of the kingdom of God. Bless these decisions and seal them is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you.